Now, coming up with creative new ideas can be challenging, but there are a range of techniques that we can utilize to support the creative processes. Now, the first of these is brainstorming, um, coming up with new ideas, uh, but there are some particular strategies around brainstorming that you can utilize. So I've given you in the notes some approaches to applying brainstorming um, and some different techniques that you can utilize. So go through the brainstorming process. Um, there are a range of different subtypes of brainstorming, but generally it's um, putting down as many ideas as you can, as quickly as you can, trying not to privilege any particular ideas, trying not to dismiss any ideas. Um, of course, they're just too ridiculous, but just get as many ideas down as you can. Then start looking at those that might be uh, particularly effective. You could group ideas into various um, classifications. Uh, you could then explore some combinations of ideas, which is a very important technique where you look at how two ideas may form a new idea. Um, so give, uh, essentially brainstorming goes through um, four steps. Uh, setting a clear objective, what it is you're trying to solve. So in the last section, we looked at different opportunities that exist within educational technology. So that may frame what you're trying to actually achieve. Then you need to go through what's called a free forming idea generation stage. Just get down as many ideas as you can. Then you go through a refinement stage where you can group them and classify them and dismiss some and so forth. And then you slowly narrow down your ideas until you get a smaller set. And from that, you then choose uh, which ideas you're going to progress forward with. So that's brainstorming. Another similar approach is mind mapping. Now, this is once we get our ideas, rather than just classifying them in sort of groups and so forth, we try to actually form formal structures of how those ideas relate to one another. And we develop that as what's called a mind map or a concept map or a thinking map. But you place your ideas down. Now, generally in the middle, you have your key idea. What is the problem you're trying to solve? Then you might put a whole range of different educational technologies around that that might relate to that problem. And then there might be a whole lot of issues related to those educational technologies, might be things like cost or um, availability or effectiveness. And you associate those different ideas with those concepts and you draw lines between them to show those relationships. And you build up your mind map um, through a whole range of branches. So ideas and branches, and it's mostly about the relationship between different concepts. And that can often identify some gaps. So where there's not a lot of branches occurring, maybe no one's really looked into that particular area. And there might be opportunities then for you to explore that. Or there may be some really significant issues being identified by some educational technologies in relation to your concept you're trying to solve but there's no really existing technologies that are available to do that. And so that might then indicate that that's an area that you could explore and try to see if you can find a technology that can address that really strong need um, in relation to the issue that you're trying to exp um, come to grips with. Then we have a process called Scamper. So this is where we think about the technology that we're going to utilize and we look at how we could um, maybe substitute uh, new technologies for existing technologies. Um, or we could look at what part of an existing technology we could replace with something else. So maybe it's a um, an educational computer game and we could replace the screen interface with a virtual reality interface. Or we could look at um, instead of using interactive whiteboards, we could use interactive tables or again, virtual reality headsets or just replacing one thing with something else. That's called substitution. We could also look at adaption where we make changes to the use of something. So 
again, maybe looking at virtual reality headsets, um, and they've got speakers on them. So maybe we could use those speakers to allow students to have listen state, listening state stations where they listen to um, someone speaking a language and then having to repeat back that language. So again, we're um, adapting the use of the virtual reality headsets to a listening station, microphone, headphone um, type station. So it's where we're adapting one technology for another use. Say for use of mobile phones um, in a classroom, uh, let's say we're teaching art and we're using the um, GPS system or the, the motion tracking system in their mobile phones to act as paintbrushes. And we can have what's known as um, light painting, where students are painting with their mobile phones in a virtual camp uh, canvas that represents their um, artwork as it's being created. So there's a range of different adaptations of existing technologies and using them for purposes that they hadn't been thought of for use before. Then we can modify technologies. So this is where we take a technology and we change it to be more useful in new ways. Now again, remember, you don't have to do this yourself. You can just propose that it's done and you can assume you've got a whole lot of programmers that can um, make the changes that you envisage are needed for your modification. So it may be taking a learning management system and modifying it with an adaptive learning system and an AI system that tracks student learning and achieves a new educational outcome as a result of that modification. Uh, we can also put things for other uses. So taking um, an existing technology and adapting it for a new use. Um, let's say driverless cars. Um, we could adapt that for uh, driver training where the driverless car is giving feedback on the road and what the, the car should do. And we could map that to what the student driver is doing and seeing how the differences between the student driver and the driverless car in making decisions about what's occurring. So there we're taking in a, a technology, driverless cars, and we're adapting its use to an educational purpose. Sometimes we might want to eliminate things. Um, so let's say we're looking at learning management systems and all the rest, and we decide to eliminate test taking. So taking the testing aspect out of that. Of course, we're, we proposition that that aspect is detrimental to the learning process, that students aren't engaging in um, the learning. Of course, they're too focused on the test taking. So that's the idea of eliminating elements out of um, an existing technology. And so all of those, the substitute, adapt, modify, put to another use and eliminate, form the scamper framework of thinking about how to use technology in different ways. Now, another technique is called reverse thinking. So this is we take an existing idea or approach and we reverse it. Um, so having an anti-social media platform where the idea is to have a, a, a platform that doesn't allow us to engage with other people, um, but it still allows us maybe to put uh, posts up and to, to share things, but they may be only for our own personal use, maybe as a reflective diary. So we're using the concept of social media but we're taking out the social aspect. Um, so there's things like anti-digital anti -digital learning tools. So where we don't want to use any digital technologies, but we still want to use the idea of a online learning platform, but take away the online learning aspect, um, which seems a bit strange, but it's looking at what is the fundamental elements of these tools and can they be used in a way that is done completely differently to how they were originally envisaged? So this is the idea of reverse thinking. Try to look at an existing process and if we completely upended it and did it in a completely different way, could new ways of learning emerge from that approach? And then we've got analogies. So 
this is looking at how we can utilize an educational technology in a new way by th um, thinking through the purposes of that technology. Um, so let's say students are, in the example I gave, struggling with reader comprehension. They're having difficulties with reading. And a similar problem is when students have difficulty with navigating. And so we're looking at two problems that are reasonably similar. Now, for navigation, we've solved that problem by the use of uh, mobile mapping and GPS systems that give directions to um, someone as they're trying to navigate. So having a similar type of solution for students when they're trying to read is the use of analogies. So we take an existing system, process, whatever, that does work well, and we look at how those processes could be applied to a different situation. Um, and that's the use of analogies. So there's some different techniques that you can utilize in coming up with new ideas around how to utilize educational technology. Now, then we have to actually develop the technology. Now, in your portfolio assessment, you don't actually develop the technology. You are going to be developing the idea for the technology. But the same processes are things we have to go through. Now, I've given you access to the EdTech Developers Guide, which goes through this process in significant detail. And I've given you a little bit of a summary of some of the key ideas as part of that. But the EdTech Developers Guide will go into more depth and detail for you to come up with your own ideas and develop those into solutions. So one key aspect is the idea of iteration. This forms the fundamental process of um, the design, where we go design, develop, and um, evaluate. We call that an iterative process. And there are a range of different um, techniques and approaches around that ideation um, process, which involves iteration. Uh, a good example would be drafting. When you go to write an essay, you don't write the, the perfect essay from start. You start with an idea, you develop it out, um, so you come up with your design, you then develop it into a first draft, and then you evaluate it. Where could it be improved? How could it be um, developed better? And then you start back again. You then think, okay, what new elements of it need to be improved? So you're redesigning it. You then develop it again. You've come up with your second draft, and then you evaluate it. Does it need a third draft? That's the idea of iteration. Now, another key aspect when we need to think about educational technologies, particularly with children, is the idea of privacy. Now, a lot of ed tech development fails to appreciate the high level of concern that exists within education around student privacy. And so it's a fundamental thing you need to consider in your educational technology development idea is whether or not it is going to meet the stringent needs to assure educators and students and parents and everyone else that student privacy is going to be maintained. So you need to think about how to do that. Um, ensuring that the data that's collected is kept private, um, that the whole process is transparent, and that, that people, students and parents and that using the technology can be assured that the data isn't going to be shared without their knowledge, um, and plan around that and um, give your considerations as to how you've ensured that that privacy is going to be sustained. Now, a lot of these technologies um, and ideas are being developed by others. And there are online communities that you can tap into and explore. And this is called networking. Um, and developers utilize networking a lot to gain assistance in the development of their ideas. Now, it doesn't mean you have to share your idea in whole with others so that they then steal the idea. But 
there's a lot of benefit that can be gained through networking and sharing your ideas. Now, in this course, you can do that through the online forums. So discussing your ideas, sharing your ideas, and getting feedback from your peers. In tutorial, you can sh share your ideas and get feedback from your lecturer and also from your peers. And the process of sharing um, can be beneficial in itself because it helps you to articulate your ideas and also to receive feedback and ideas on how it can be improved where you, there may be things that you haven't thought about that others have considered in their own developments. Now, in industry and in developing educational technology ideas, there are a whole range of other more formalized approaches to networking, such as um, hackathons and entrepreneurial startup weekends and um, unconferences and a whole range of other mechanisms, often supported by governments um, because there is a generally a need for startups and innovative um, companies and they can generally lead to a lot of um, benefit commercially with relatively small investment in supporting the ideation process for these startup companies. So there are two main elements around that, incubators and accelerators. So incubators are really designed to support the generation of ideas and accelerators take ideas and commercialize them. Um, so they have two different focuses. Um, they rely upon two different levels of funding and support, but they are available and um, we'll discuss some of those different affordances in the tutorial. But think about it as though you were starting it up as a company and you needed funding to be able to commercialize it and to develop it. Uh, what avenues of support could you um, approach? How you would approach them, how you would pitch your idea, which is essentially what you're doing for your portfolio assessment. You're putting forward an idea around an educational technology and trying to convince that it is going to be beneficial in terms of educational outcomes, but it is also feasible in terms of being able to be developed. So there are lots of opportunities for funding of such um, endeavors. Uh, educational organizations are probably the, the key thing that um, you need to think about, but there are sources such as crowdfunding, where you put forward your idea and ask for investments through uh, various online um, sources. There are grants and innovation funds where you can approach governments and philanthropic bodies that can provide money to support startups. There's angel in investors and venture capitalists. Now they have, again, different um, challenges around them. Uh, generally, they want to see a return of their investment. And so you give up some of your control over your process in doing so, but they may be the um, best way of gaining funding to bring your idea into fruition. Now you also need to think about who the product is going to be for. Who is going to utilize your educational technology? Is it going to be a traditional educational organization, a school, a university, maybe it's homeschooling? Um, but think about what is the age level who is it going to be for everybody or is it going to be specifically for a particular age level? Is it going to be for a particular sector of education? Is it for the private education market or government education market? Um, what sort of infrastructure is going to be needed? Is it a whole AI system that's going to need a supercomputer that's going to run all of this and so forth? Or is it going to be so people can run on their mobile phones and has, as a mobile device? Um, so you need to think about what's going to be required to support your educational innovation. Um, are there going to be key people that are going to be needed to be convinced and brought on board? Does it going to need a whole range of technology support staff to maintain and keep this running? Is it going to need the school leadership or the organizational leadership to come on board and agree to it? Or could individual um, teachers and academics engage with it and start from a bottom up process of introducing it into an educational organization. So think also around how it could be used by students. Can they just only use it at the institution or can they also use it at home? Um, and try to think about it from the student's perspective. 
how are they going to engage with it? Yes, it may be attractive for the educational organization. It may give them more control and um, management of students, but will students appreciate that and will they engage with it? Now, again, all of this can be supported by improvements in decision making. And there are different ways of um, improving your own decision making around coming up with an educational technology. One approach is to have a champion or a mentor that gives you support around your um, ideation process. Um, gaining support from other organizations such as unions and um, education departments and so forth can help identify the various issues that you need to address before it becomes acceptable to utilize that technology in an organization. Um, having an allocation within budgets within education organizations is very important. Um, so before you put all the investment into coming up with this new idea and um, creating it for your school or for your university or whatever, um, having a commitment that they're going to fund that development or the implementation. And then there's just making sure that you meet all the requirements of an organization um, in terms of its suitability for use with students. And, and is your application, your tool going to be strategically placed? Are there lots and lots of competitors or is it a niche market that you've identified that only really your tool is addressing and can exploit that opportunity? So there are just some other ideas to think around developing your educational technology application. Now, finally, two key areas where many of these tools fail is, is it going to be sustainable? Yes, it may be achievable with all of your passion and interest around supporting it, but when you move on or it needs to be um, utilized in another organization, is that going to be able to be achievable and utilized there? So think about how it might be funded. That's often a key area. Is it going to be um, only funded by an initial grant? And can that then be sustained once that grant disappears? Or can it be utilized in organizations where they don't have that initial grant to support the development? Is it going to be used through, um, funded by the users? Um, now there are various models around that where they purchase the technology or there might be a freemium model where they can purchase or they can get access to a free version that doesn't have the full capacity of the paid version. And there are a range of different techniques that are utilized to fund and support the development and implementation of educational technologies. Um, is it going to be sold directly to parents or to students rather than through the institutions? Um, can it be uh, packaged within licensing of other uh, products. So it might be, say, a, a learning management um, tool that can be put into other learning management systems. And so it could be sold and incorporated into other applications. Or it can just be a value added service where it analyzes data and supports other applications and tools. So there are a range of different ways of sustaining and growing the um, essentially the business model of your tool. But so many educational technologies fail because they don't consider those aspects. And while they're a great idea individually, they just don't scale or have the sustainability to have a long-term impact. And finally, a key aspect around that can be software interoperability and, and open data. Um, software changes all of the time. Uh, probably the biggest example of that was around the Flash uh, programming language. And billions of dollars were spent on developing um, educational applications in the Flash programming language, which allowed um, animations to occur on the web. And a decision was made to discontinue that programming language, mostly because of security concerns, and it just was, wasn't robust enough. And a lot of educational organizations, um, including Australia, which spent billions of dollars developing lots and lots of um, what we call learning objects, which are short interactive animations and activities that could be um, run on 
on computers that would help students learn small concepts. But all of that ha disappeared because the uh, programming language changed. So again, these are things to think about in terms of long-term um, scalability and longevity of your development. Um, giving the ease of access to utilize the tool can be a significant issue. If the students have to remember a specific password and login just to use your tool, that can be a challenge. And that's where we've gone to what's called interoperability, um, single sign-on interoperability, where you can sign on once and you can get access to a whole range of tools. Um, we're seeing this also with things like uh, Google sign-on or signing on with your Gmail account or signing on with your um, Facebook account. That allows you then to access a whole, whole range of tools without having to remember specific individual login names and passwords. Um, then there's also just around data. Is your data being stored in a way that other tools can't utilize that data? That may then limit its applicability and, and people's interest in your educational application. So again, things to think about, but they're not key elements for your educational um, application, but they are things that if you are developing an educational application, you would need to think about and to consider. And we'll discuss these in the tutorial.